This is lecture six. In lecture five, we covered the brain's involvement in voluntary motor actions. We went through action potentials. Uh, we distinguished upper and lower motor neurons, and we made it to the neuromuscular junction. Um, in this lecture, we'll jump that junction and complete the muscle contraction. Altogether, this is called excitation contraction coupling. Uh, we talked about this in the last lecture, but as a reminder, upper motor neurons activate lower neurons with glutamate, and lower motor neurons depolarize muscle fibers using acetylcholine. Um, the connection between lower motor neurons and muscle fibers is where we'll pick up today. This is a look at the axon terminals. On the right, you can see a couple of alpha motor neurons exiting the ventral root. Uh, as they approach the target muscle, they divide into terminal branches. Uh, in the diagram, there's a single digit number of branches. It's going to be a lot more than that. Um, but the diagram would be hectic if there were 200 of these nerve terminals or uh, terminal mountains. Um, that's what these branching nerve endings are called. Uh, they branch close to the muscle and they lose their myelin sheath when they do, uh, which would slow down nerve conduction velocity a lot. It does slow down nerve conduction velocity a lot, uh, but there's really no distance left to travel, so it barely matters. Uh, now, in most muscles, all the muscles you're thinking about, unless you're thinking about laryngeal muscles or something, uh, there's only one neuromuscular junction per fiber. And it joins that fiber approximately in the middle, in the longitudinal middle, uh, so that action potential can spread in an even way from the center out. Uh, when the action potential finishes traveling down a motor neuron and it reaches the terminal, voltage-gated calcium channels open, and that permits calcium to enter. Um, now, there are synaptic vesicles. These, they're like tiny balloons. Uh, that contain acetylcholine in this part of the neuron. And each one of these vesicles contains five to 10,000 molecules of acetylcholine. It contains a lot. And the calcium that comes in binds to proteins on the surface of those uh, vesicles. Uh, synaptotagmin proteins in the membranes is what they're called. Uh, um, you don't need to know that, but when, when calcium binds to those proteins, the vesicles become activated and their activation facilitates exocytosis, which just means they release their acetylcholine. The vesicles fuse with the membrane and dump their contents into the synaptic cleft. Uh, the acetylcholine then crosses a tenth of a micrometer distance, according to this article, but that's actually larger than other articles report. Uh, and it binds to thousands of receptors on the other side. Uh, on the motor end plate, which has somewhere around 10,000 acetylcholine receptors per square micrometer. Uh, the receptors uh, that the acetylcholine binds to, these are nicotinic as opposed to muscarinic. Uh, as the name suggests, nicotine stimulates nicotinic acetylcholine re uh, receptors, but not the muscarinic ones. And muscarine, uh, which is in some mushrooms, uh, binds to muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, but doesn't stimulate the nicotinic ones. Um, now, muscarinic receptors, these are all over the place. They're in your central nervous system and smooth muscle. Uh, they, they mediate the autonomic function of your organs, but they're not in skeletal muscle. In skeletal muscle, you have nicotinic receptors. And once acetylcholine binds to those receptors, there's an influx of sodium into the muscle. And re remember that the resting membrane potential of muscle isn't negative 70, it's about negative 90. Um, but the charge, um, that, that voltage, as it changes, that change in membrane potential is what stimulates the muscle to contract. And we'll get there in just a minute. Uh, but first, there are some conditions that can affect this process. We'll talk about a few of them today and more in future lectures. Uh, the first is myasthenia gravis, which means grave muscle weakness. And this is an autoimmune disease uh, in which antibodies are produced that block or destroy the acetylcholine receptors. Uh, so you'll get the release of acetylcholine, 
um, but the amount that's binding on the motor end plate will be drastically reduced. Uh, so you wind up with grave muscle weakness. And places with a lower density of acetylcholine receptors tend to present more obvious symptoms. Uh, that's why droopy eyelids are common. Maybe there's problems chewing. Um, but it's about how many acetylcholine receptors you have. And anything that increases or decreases binding of acetylcholine to the nicotinic receptors will affect the force of a muscle's contraction. Uh, now, when the motor neuron is done being stimulated, when it's done releasing acetylcholine, you have to break it down. You break down your acetylcholine. Uh, lots of neurotransmitters, I mean, these often get absorbed. So think like serotonin, uh, that gets taken back up by the nerve, uh, which permits drugs like SSRIs to be effective. That's Paxil and, and Prozac and Zoloft. Um, these are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. There are also NDRIs, that's norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitors. Uh, that's Ritalin and Welbuterin. Um, and cocaine inhibits the reuptake of all of these. Uh, but acetylcholine is different. It doesn't get reabsorbed. Uh, it gets broken down by acetylcholine esterase. Uh, that's an enzyme in the cleft. Uh, although the choline part um, does get used as an ingredient to, to build more acetylcholine. But if you can't break down your acetylcholine, if something stops uh, your acetylcholine esterase from working, uh, you're going to uh, preserve that muscle action in an uncontrollable way. And that's how some flea medications work. That's how you know, insecticides work. And it's also how nerve gas works, sarin gas. This was developed in the 1930s by scientists who were trying to create better pesticides. Uh, and then they turned out to be a really horrible war weapon. Um, but it's an inhibitor of acetylcholine esterase. If you inhale it, you won't be able to break down your acetylcholine. And if you can't do that, a lot of problems happen. Uh, nicotinic and muscarinic both. So uh, in the movie The Rock, Nicolas Cage is exposed to nerve gas, to sarin gas. And there's a very dramatic scene where he has to inject himself in the, in the heart uh, with a needle of, of atropine uh, to counteract it. And atropine is a competitive inhibitor of muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Uh, we'll talk all about the different classes of enzyme inhibitors later this semester. Uh, but for now, let me just say, this is all drama, okay? <laughs> like injecting the atropine straight into the heart. Um, and the reality is he still would have died uh, because atropine only interacts with muscarinic receptors, not nicotinic. So, I mean, after a, after a phase of uncontrollable jerking and, and bodily twitching, uh, Mr. Cage, he, he would have died of asphyxiation owing to the inability to control his breathing muscles. Uh, but his heart rate would have been elevated while he died uh, because acetylcholine reduces heart rate through muscarinic receptors. Sarin gas would have exaggerated that effect. Uh, but by blocking the the um, that effect with, with, atrophy, with atropine, um, the sympathetic nervous system would have predominated and his heart rate would have um, gone back up right, while he died. Uh, but he lived right in the movie. Uh, he lived and the movie went on. And um, there are also, though, you know, if the movie were more accurate, there are uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor antagonists too, uh, like adacurium. Uh, adacurium is a powerful muscle relaxant. So I guess if you were to do adacurium uh, and atropine, maybe it would have been a little bit more compelling. Uh, but here's what we have so far. Uh, on our way from the brain to skeletal muscle contraction, uh, an upper motor neuron gets excited. Okay, uh, or in the primary motor cortex. That action potential travels down the spine. It synapses with a lower motor neuron. Uh, glutamate is the neurotransmitter that does the synapsing. Uh, the lower motor neuron exits through the ventral horn and the action potential travels along its axon toward the target muscle. It reaches the end of the nerve, the terminal, 
some calcium uh, channels open. So calcium enters, that calcium binds to the synaptic vesicles uh, and those vesicles contain acetylcholine and they become activated. They dock, right? They fuse with the cell's membrane and they release their acetylcholine into the cleft. Uh, it crosses that cleft and it binds to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and that depolarizes the sarcolemma. From there, uh, the electrical message travels down these holes, down these invaginations uh, in the sarcolemma, uh, and they're called T-tubules. Those holes are, T stands for transverse, they're transverse tubules, T-tubules. Uh, so now the electrical activity is, is entering the muscle itself. But before we travel down a T-tubule, let's just take a look at where all of this stuff is. Uh, earlier, I said acetylcholine binds on nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on the motor end plate. Uh, the motor end plate is just a part of the sarcolemma, uh, which is the muscle's plasma membrane. Uh, you can see that in the diagram to the right. The endomecium is more superficial. Uh, the sarcolemma is beneath it. Uh, you can also see dystrophin in there. Uh, that links actin to some support protein. So like muscular dystrophy, that would be a deficiency of dystrophin. Uh, now let's orient ourselves to where the T-tubules are. Uh, these are at the junctions of the I and A bands, uh, right where myosin ends. That's where the uh, electrical signals enter the muscle. Uh, and it conducts its way um, down a T-tubule uh, until it reaches a dihydropyridine receptor. Uh, it's part of a voltage-dependent calcium channel. And when that gets zapped, the dihydropyridine receptor, it changes its shape. It changes its conformation. Uh, now, remember how cross-bridge cycling involves troponin changing its shape? Uh, and once troponin changes that conformation, that causes movement in the tropomyosin facilitating contraction. This is kind of similar. Uh, the shape changing dihydropyridine receptors are linked to the ryanidine receptors, which are connected to the sarcoplasmic reticula. Uh, the ryanidine receptors then open and this facilitates the release of calcium. Think of ryanidine receptors as the doors out of a sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and this is called depolarization induced calcium release, DICR. Uh, but not all of the ryanidine receptors are connected to dihydropyridine receptors. And those that aren't can't be uh, directly opened by the depolarization of the T tubules. Uh, now, remember how a small influx of sodium caused a huge influx of sodium uh, because that little influx caused the voltage-gated sodium channels to open, and so sodium flooded in. A little bit of sodium triggers a lot bit of sodium. Uh, this is, again, similar. There's a similar phenomenon um, that the calcium leaking out of the sarcoplasmic reticula uh, because of the changing shape of the dihydropyridine receptors, that triggers the rest of the ryanidine receptors to open. And this is called calcium-induced calcium release, CICR. And this outpouring of calcium from the reticula is what binds to the troponin C and facilitates excitation contraction coupling. It finishes the job. Uh, but as soon as the muscle is done with its contraction, the um, sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium ATP aces right, it's an ATPase uh, that pumps the calcium back into the reticula, uh, where it binds very loosely to calciquestrin. We'll talk about um, calcium in the reticula uh, at the end of the semester. But for now, uh, that's its storage silo, and the contraction is over. Once you put calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, contraction is over. Uh, tropomyosin slides back over the binding sites on actin and myosin's heads are left lonely.
Uh, so wrapping things up, you should be able to work through excitation contraction coupling from the beginning to the end. Um, so, uh, you know, I begin in the brain, but, but uh, you know, what happens at the nerve terminal, that's where we began today. Um, how acetylcholine crosses the cleft, how the signal enters the muscle, and how it causes the release of calcium. You should also be able to answer some specific questions about the process and label some diagrams um, and a few more questions and another diagram. But that's it for this lecture. I'll see you in lecture seven uh, when we get into reflex arcs.